Welcome to Global Innovation. I am your host, Chris Graham. On our show today, we are fortunate to have guests who focus their innovative talents on helping others. During our first segment, we are joined by the founder of Greater Good Haiti, Kelly Kobza, and her good friend, Robin Bujeja. In 2010, after Haiti was hit hard by an earthquake, Kelly became active in providing Haitians hands-on relief. Now, she was alarmed by the high illiteracy rate and founded Greater Good Haiti to promote remedial education for children who have otherwise no means of attending school. Her efforts now extend to a literacy school, a reforestation project, a community center, and a feeding program for the students. Now, Robin, a fellow teacher from the Bay Area, she recently traveled to Haiti to assist Kelly, and we're going to have her share her unvarnished observations. In our second segment today, we will be joined by Stephanie Martinson, the founder of Racing Hearts, an organization focused on improving a person's chance of survival from sudden cardiac arrest. Her vision of increasing at the community level the availability of AEDs, portable heart defibrillators, is having a direct impact on saving lives. So let's start with Kelly and Robin. Thank you both for joining us. Good morning. Now, Kelly, I'm going to start with you, and, and you have a background as an educator. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. I have. I had the privilege of growing up in Palo Alto and being educated in Palo Alto schools. I um, went to university and became a teacher myself and worked in Palo Alto as an educator. And at some point, I realized that it was quite a privilege that, you know, it was bestowed on to me by chance and that maybe I could go elsewhere and share my privilege and my skill set. So I um, went to Spain to learn to speak Spanish and ended up in Haiti where they speak Creole. <laughs> All right. And in 2010, uh, the earthquake hits Haiti, a lot of devastation. Tell us about your journey uh, through Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. Oh, when I arrived, it was heartbreaking. Um, building upon building, pancaked people still in, in dire need, living in tent cities. I was working with a Haitian doctor. Um, we traveled to tent cities and did medical relief. Um, it was really <laughs> a very difficult uh, time in my life uh, just to see so much misery. And you came up with an idea to try to uh, make education available. And tell us about the first steps and the difficulties that you had. Well, through my work, I started realizing that um, there were other problems in Haiti, deeper problems. Um, the earthquake is a deep problem, but um, Haiti's been sort of a forgotten nation for a long time, and there are some very deep problems that I think could be solved through education. So I started looking into education. It's my field, um, and I discovered that there's a literacy rate of 52% in Haiti, um, more than 50% of the children are not attending schools, and I thought I could plug in and do something about that in a small village, in a small way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, have, you had the first step. Tell us about the first step and the difficulties you had. So, um, I ended up in the town of Ansagalet on the island of Lagonave, uh, and I initially thought that I would start sponsoring children to go to school. Um, but that didn't work out so well because um, the student I chose to sponsor a pilot for my um, idea, um, they put him in a kindergarten class and he was 11. He'd never been to school before so they put him in a kindergarten class. It didn't work out because intellectually he was far advanced and um, he, he was the class clown and he ended up third from the bottom of his class when the reporting period came around. So I started looking around for a school that would have some remediation and found none. So, so rather than give up, you doubled down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I was walking the village one day after talking to two different principals and thinking, how can I solve this problem? What can I do? And it came to me that I could just hire a teacher and then sort of train the teacher to give a, rem a remediation program to the kids, teaching them to read and write and maybe some mathematics and see how that works and then maybe develop something if it does work and if not, well, think again. But it did work. And you founded Greater Good Haiti? I did. I went home and talked to some friends and they wanted to help support my efforts so we founded an, a 501c3 nonprofit 
Greater Good International, and so that we could accept donations and people would feel free to donate to a tax-free, I mean, giving a tax-free donation. Okay, so Greater Good Haiti starts off by founding a school? Well, it's, a, it's an education program. We have to be very careful not to call it a school because if we're a school, then we have to accept kindergartners. And our program takes children who are between 9 and 12 who have never been in school before. It's sort of a safety net for them to be able to catch up and continue with their educational um, endeavors. Okay, tell us some of the successes that you've had in that program. Well, um, it was an organic evolution in that after the first year, we hired a second teacher because we needed <laughs> a second year. And then we could take 12 more students in the first year. And it's a three-year program um, that after three years, the kids are ready to take the matriculation exam. There's a national matriculation exam. Um, the national average to pass that exam is 20%. 20% of the people who take the exam pass it? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So there are intrinsic problems in the education system, but that's not what I'm dealing with. I'm just dealing with catching the kids okay, so, so that they can carry on. So w when you had your first group of, of graduates, if you will, from your program, how did they do when they took that exam? The first group, we passed 62%. Wow, success. Yeah. yeah. Then um, we tweaked the program. We saw that the problem was in the French because the program is in French. The, uh, our program's not in French, but we teach French so that the exam is in French. And the children must pass a, an exam that is not their mother language, and they must pass ex this exam. And I think that's part of why there's only a 20% passing rate. Um, so we tweaked our program and uh, amped up the French. And the second year, we had a 100% passing rate. And the third year, again, a 100% passing rate. And that's where we are now. We have 27 graduates from our program. Well, well we have a, a few pictures of, of the program. Let's start with the uh, first picture. And what are we seeing here? Um, well, that's, that's our current school, the way it is, the program. We have a big room with three, class, three classes in that room. Um, a chalkboard for each class on the wall, and the students all engage in, throughout the day in their program with their individual teachers. It's a 12 to 1 ratio, which is part of why we can go so quickly, and the teachers really have a vested interest in their 12 students. Um, we know them well, um, we get to know their families very well, and we have a, a strong sense of community, and I think it's because we only have 12 students per teacher. Tell me, how is, is the program received by the parents? Were they initially suspicious, open-armed, welcome? How did that go about? Well, parents at first, you know, they're really excited to have their kids in any education program because they can't afford to put them in a program. So they're excited. And initially they're like, so what grade is my kid in? Um, <laughs> what level are they at? And it took a long time for them to get used to the idea that it's a three-year program and we're not calling it grade levels. We're calling it level one, level two, and level three. And level three at the end, they'll be prepared for the sixth grade matriculation exam. After the first year, parents understood. Many of our parents are illiterate themselves. I mean, it's a, it's a generational... Um, it's an ongoing problem. Yeah. So... Um, well, so well, yeah, after, th after thir the third year, they realize, oh, now we get it. And we help support them in uh, secondary schools, too, so that they can continue their education, because we know their families aren't able to pay. And uh, we have a, s a second photo, and this one is of you with a group of students, and tell us what you're doing in this picture. Yeah. Um, so Haitian schools are really, um, it's education by rote. And so I merged that. I don't want to step on what they do because that's what they know. Uh, but I want to infuse some of what we know are um, uh, st um, strategies. Teaching methods. And yeah, strategies and teaching methods that help um, enhance a child's uh, understanding of the material. So having hands on activities. And in that picture, I'm um, helping kids learn how to play a game that uh, supports computation skills. 
which is really important because when children learn to solve problems and they can do it in a creative way, then other problems besides math become creatively solved, yeah? Uh, because you have a lot of energy, you've not just limited it to the knowledge aspect, but I understand that you've also uh, created a, a food program for the children as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, kids were coming to school hungry, <laughs> and you can't learn when you're hungry. You don't have the energy, your brain doesn't have what it needs, the nutrition for learning, so we feed the kids every day, we feed them lunch, and we also feed lunch to people who want to come and volunteer at our space. So it creates an opportunity for people from the community to come and help out, maybe tutor a kid who's having a hard time, or help clean the yard, or help in the kitchen, and then they can also eat. But the children eat every day um, a home-cooked meal. We have a cook and an assistant cook, and uh, yeah. And what is your biggest challenge as you look forward to one year, three years, five years? Mm. Well, the biggest challenge? Mm. I, don't, I don't see the challenges ahead of me. I just see them when they confront me. So it's hard to say what, is, what do I foresee is the biggest challenge. Um, there's corruption. You have to deal with uh, you know, the authorities. And you have to be able to, um, to negotiate with them to be able to run your program. Um, we're currently trying to get our NGO registered with the Haitian government so that we're nationally recognized there and maybe help the Haitian um, Education Department, the Ministry of Education, uh, maybe buy into what we're doing so that we could ameliorate the situation not just in our little town but in other villages and towns. Now, if I wanted to help out by donating money, and I understand all organizations can use that type of help, would I go to the website? Yeah, you can go to www.greatergoodhaiti.org, or you can go to our Facebook page. Both have donate toggles. Um, Facebook is also Greater Good um, Haiti. Yeah. Great. Now, Robin, uh, you traveled to Haiti to visit Kelly and to spend some time helping out. I'm really interested in, in your views, someone who uh, didn't have all the background of the six or seven years building the program, but arriving on the program and seeing what it was like currently. Tell us a little bit about your observations. Well, I have to tell you, I was very excited about um, this adventure. Actually, is the way I saw it. I was fascinated by what Kelly was doing, and I wanted to see firsthand um, how she was you know, creating such success. I mean, so, so I asked her a little bit more. I kept asking little questions here and there about well, how does this work and what are they doing and, and just breaking it down to um, how are the teachers able to take children who have never gone to school in such a poor country and having 100% passing rate. It's mm -hmm. amazing. You know, so as a teacher myself, I was just like, what are they doing? <laughs> so, I, so I went and saw for myself. Um, and I'd have to say, you know, when people say Haiti's a poor country, what does that mean, right? And so when I went, I found firsthand what does that mean, what they're, what they're dealing with on a daily basis. I mean, so when I stayed with Kelly, we probably live closer to the way Haitians live, which means uh, they have to go get water in a bucket for bathing and cooking and drinking water, and there's you know, limited electricity, and there's the heat, and there's uh, dirt roads and animals, you know, running about. There's goats and pigs. And um, and if the students aren't in a program such as what Kelly has put together, what do the, the school-aged children do? So one of the things I did observe, too, so she's right in the coast. It's beautiful. She's abso it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so I do have to tell you, too, that, that the beauty of Haiti is also you also see garbage everywhere. And, um, and then their children, when I was, Kelly, I wanted to say this because I just thought, wow, look at this. So she sets the example, right? So she's the model. She has the beach completely, the coast cleaned, you know, twice a week, anything that comes up on shore. So the people that are there, the parents that come, the children, they see what a beautiful place it is, but it takes an effort because when they leave that place, they go outside and see garbage everywhere. Now. Um, sometimes I would observe some of the children with like a little fishing line. They, they'd come by in a boat off the coast. And so 
the other children were in school, but these children were just out unsupervised out in the world. So um, one of the stories <coughs> you were telling me had uh, dealt with some children that you saw out in the playground playing. We have a picture of them uh, right now with uh, <laughs> materials, and it looked like a, a, some rough dice. Can you tell us what that picture is telling us? So I have to tell you that was, um, I think, for both of us, like one of probably the highlights of the trip. So you're, you know, we were there um, actually working with the teachers, you know, doing some development in the mathematical area of computation, teaching them games, working with the kids. So Kelly had just, in the photograph prior to that, you saw where the children were learning one of the games that we taught. And so the next morning, I'm, I'm walking to go, you know, they have a raising of the flag, so I, I was walking out towards the school. Kelly goes, come quick, quick. <laughs> She goes, you have to see this quick, quick. And I came over, and they're all gathered on the ground, you know, these boys. And I go, what are they doing? What are they doing? And I looked over, and there in his notebook, he had completely copied the game that we showed him in his notebook. And he had made homemade dice. <laughs> you need three to play the game. So I think he used styrofoam and put little dots. So he had his dice, and they were playing the game, you know, before school started. So. I don't know if you have to be a teacher to understand this, but Kelly and I were just had tears in our eyes. It's just a very touching moment when the children themselves take and engage in what you know you've brought to them. So this this is a program which uh, not only did you set up, you have stuck with. You don't <laughs> just come back to Palo Alto and now you're living your life in Palo Alto and it was really nice. You're actually continuing to be involved. Mm -hmm. I spend half my time, about half my time in Haiti. I spend about two months and come back for two months or a month and then I go back. I go back and forth at least three times a year. It's just amazing. It's amazing how an individual can make a difference and the money that goes to your organization goes to the kids. Directly to the program. This is how people make a difference individually and as a group. This is a great organization to support and once again their website is at greatergoodhaiti.org. Thank you both for being on our show today. Thanks Thank for you. having us. And welcome to our show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Chris for having me. Now I want to start off with uh, talking a little bit about the name Racing Hearts. Interesting name. Tell us a little bit about how that name came about and what it means. Sure. Racing Hearts believes in heart safety and heart wellness and access to automated external defibrillators, life-saving heart defibrillators. Um, and so when a person is experiencing a sudden cardiac arrest, they are, the heart is experiencing um, that it's quivering and it appears that it is actually shaking. It's an electrical problem. And so we named ourselves Racing Hearts. Okay, and so the organization is uh, focused on making AEDs available in the community, correct? Yes. And how'd you come up with that idea? Um, about five years ago, I was actually enthralled with post-traumatic stress syndrome and I wasn't living the life that I wanted to and I truly believe in the idea of continuous personal growth and learning from others and giving back to the community and so I took a step forward and my experience um, while climbing up Yosemite's Half Dome I had an aborted sudden cardiac arrest Wow! and I took that personal experience and I saw a critical need in our community. And we have these really fun community events, a 5K, 10K race, and saw that there was no on-site AEDs, and ran over to the local university and talked to the athletic director and said, we need an AED, and I gave him the standard of care and the statistics, picked up two AEDs, ran over to the event, and Racing Hearts was born. So a lot of people um, may have heard the term AED, but what exactly is an AED and how does it operate? And we actually have a picture of one over here on the monitor. So an AED is a device that's a mobile device. You can carry it. And what it does is it determines 
um, if the person needs a shock it, um, through the heart. And it is the only device that will actually um, bring the heart rhythm back um, to a normal. So if someone's having a uh, basically a heart attack, to use layman's terms, uh, an AED can be used, deployed, the paddles can be put on the person, and then the heart can be shocked into a regular rhythm? Correct. And it actually determines if the person needs a shock. So it gives the um, person auditory cues and visual cues of where to put the pads and how to actually place it. And it determines if the person needs a shock or not. So it, it's foolproof. It, it actually can't hurt someone who's in a sudden cardiac arrest. And heart attacks, there's actually, we, likely a lot of us know of community members who've had a heart attack but 30% of heart attacks turn into a sudden cardiac arrest. So having access to them in critical high risk areas is a huge need. It sounds like an idea that's a good idea, but one which is hard to implement in, in the real world. How did you convince the community, the local community, to spend the money to put these devices, uh, made them available in police cars and in schools and, and parks? It's a great question. So I am just one person and I have my story, my one story. But when we build coalitions and we build and we tell people and we ask them questions of how to bring in um, partnerships, then we can do so much more. Really, sudden cardiac arrest is a silent epidemic. There's so few people that survive sudden cardiac arrests that we have no champions. And so by telling my story and learning from others and collaborating and building those coalitions, we have done an incredibly amount of work here, not only for our county and our Bay Area, but for the whole state of California. Um, we pioneered um, Senate Bill 658 that was just um, signed by Governor Brown. And what does that do? And it brings, um, so it's, it's statewide, and it changes the California state law to reducing the risk and liability and bringing California actually one of the most progressive relative to AEDs in the whole country. So if I remember that law, that, that is one that allows an individual such as myself to take the AED uh, off a wall at a park and rec uh, building and actually use it without worrying about the liability that I'll be sued if I use it incorrectly. So the way the law was written 20, 25 years ago, Title 22, it said in the law that you had to have a certain amount of people that were certified in CPR AED training. And not only did they have to be certified, but they had to be present during a sudden cardiac arrest. So what proactive businesses and schools and parks and rec, they wanted to have AEDs, but you couldn't guarantee that someone was going to be there during a sudden cardiac arrest. It would be certified. Certified. And on top of that, there was no statistical significance saying that if you were certified and I wasn't, and you used an AED versus me using an AED, that the cognitive status, the end result of the patient, would be any different. And so we took the bureaucracy away and we said, you don't need to be certified because there was no statistics. Um, and it's actually very incredible that not only was the American Red Cross and the American Heart Association fully supported our bill SB 658. So you're an individual, you have this epiphany, you go out and you create this entire organization. Uh, and it sounds like you've had a, a lot of success. And one thing that I noticed when I was at your website, and that's uh, RaisingHearts.org. Yes. Okay. Uh, was the large number of devices which, through your efforts, have actually been deployed. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So in the four years that we've been around since the fall of 2012, we've already deployed over 500 AEDs in our community. And it's protecting the heart safety of over a million four hundred community members in our area. In fact, uh, I saw on the news just recently the Palo Alto Police Department 
recently saved two individuals using these devices? Yes. Yeah, so the very beginning was just about advocacy, grassroots advocacy, and learning to see who believes in our mission and why. And so I went to our city council and said, I would like to encourage you to place AEDs and gave them the statistics. And we put in the very first, um, within three months, um, the city council voted for $92,000 worth of AEDs wow. and placed 52 AEDs throughout the community and we handpicked the locations. And in the first two years, they were used 18 times. That's, that's phenomenal. Raising money for a charitable organization is not easy. I, I know that very well. Uh, tell me some of the steps that you engage in to try to raise money for the organization. So it's all about collaboration. It's all about showing success, um, being nimble, um, and supporting each other. This isn't about me and my story. And this isn't actually really about racing hearts. This is about doing good for the community, that we should all actually support life-saving heart defibrillators. We believe in it, um, really, because we just assume that they're going to be there. And one day, it, it will they will be like fire extinguishers. I'm 100% sure about that. You know, one of the activities that Racing Hearts puts on is a race, an annual race. Tell us a little bit about that race. Great. Um, so every March, um, the winter, we um, have been lucky and fortunate enough to partner with Stanford Healthcare and Stanford University, and we put on a 5K, 10K walk and run, um, and supporting active living for heart disease. The money goes towards heart research as well as community life-saving heart defibrillators. And it's a, it, it was a fantastic experience this past, um, this past year where we had um, someone who had had a heart transplant. Um, six weeks later, she's out there cheering with her community about the importance of heart research and AEDs. Well, your work is truly phenomenal. And so are you. This is a, a situation similar to what former Speaker of the House, the late Tip O'Neill, once famously observed, all politics are local. Charitable organizations are likewise evaluated based on their ability to have an impact at the local level. We've seen during our show today that the efforts of Racing Hearts and Greater Good Haiti have had a direct and profound impact in the San Francisco Bay and in Haiti, respectively. This has been Global Innovation. I'm your host, Chris Graham. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Global Innovation. I will be your host, Chris Graham. This show is about the process of innovation. Silicon Valley constantly sees new ideas, approaches, and products. But how do the creators get to be innovative in the first place? Where does the spark come from? And how do they take that initial concept and scale it into a viable solution? Why do so many ideas go nowhere? Yet some people successfully take multiple concepts from vision to implementation. Over the course of a half hour each week, we will explore innovative approaches wherever they may occur, both in the private and the public sectors. We will discuss the problems that challenge innovators, the solutions they have developed, and the results they have achieved. We are looking for companies and organizations interested in appearing on our show to discuss their innovative approaches, whether as part of a multi-company show or for a full 30-minute presentation with a theme dedicated to your vision. For more information on broadcast availability and pricing, please visit us on our website at roadwayintel.com. Thank you.